Okay, so um, my background is um, I have three different degrees in research economics, in agricultural engineering, and in biological engineering. And I got the biological engineering degree as one of the first PhDs in that field at Cornell University. Um, since then, in 1997, I've been working on incorporating biology into both agricultural systems and, and biomass energy systems and uh, working with microorganisms. But it wasn't really until 2004 that I started to work with synthetic biology. So the, the changes I've seen since 2004 are really quite dramatic. A lot of the ideas were there. Um, people had thought really clearly about what an engineering design process should look like that was based on biology. But uh, the, the tools to actually do the wetware, uh, the, the lab work efficiently, uh, really weren't very well developed. There were a lot of things that just didn't work out for one reason or another. Um, there are also a, a much greater availability of design tools right now, computational design tools to help people think through what they want to do, what's possible, and how well it will work. I, I think since 2004 we've only seen an expanded number of possibilities. I don't think anything's really been taken off the table. Uh, our capability to do stuff has gotten, gotten greater. And, um, and that's been partly because, you know, it's the science has advanced, the tools have advanced, we understand more. Um, but it's also because of a lot of creativity that's been injected into the system. And I think iGEM has been a great uh, contributor to that. Well, I think the, the possibilities are really very broad. So if you look at the, the energy systems that I'm working in, uh, we have microbes active in the, uh, the soil and, and various uh, biomass handling systems, in the conversion processes. Uh, many of those are now being modified using synthetic biology techniques. And every time that's done, we have a more efficient, more uh, cost-effective, and more energy efficient strategy that uh, is going to produce renewable energy for our world. Um, we also are seeing impacts in the food system, um, where there's been genetic engineering by more conventional techniques for a long, long time. But um, there have been some issues with that, unintended consequences, uh, a lot of uh, very slow uh, improvements, a lot of difficulties. And plants are not very easy to work with. Uh, they haven't, there hasn't been much synthetic biology done on plants to date. But I think they're a huge opportunity for having impact for uh, food and health and also the environment in the future. Um, there are also opportunities in cleaning up environmental impacts of the past, uh, bioremediation, in, in green chemistry, uh, trying to create new products that are cleaner and better than uh, the products we have available today. Um, lots of opportunities and applications in health in the med medical area and pharmaceutical area. So um, I don't think there are too many areas of society, uh, at least that interact with living things, that we don't expect some impacts and maybe some areas which right now we rely on non-living systems computation for example we might find some real advantages to using living systems in the future well i think the real risks with synthetic biology are those that are common with most complex systems which are unintended con consequences uh, things that you know the system's complex you might think you have a good solution for one problem but you might in implementing that solution create other kinds of problems and I think we've seen that with some conventional genetic engineering. For example, in, in agricultural systems, uh, genetically modified crops, uh, resistant to particular pests. Um, sometimes the pests then develop a, um, you know, a way around that particular resistance. And once that happens, those pests are much more difficult to control by conventional means. Uh, similarly, there's been outcrossing of, of uh, resistance to herbicides into wild type relatives of some cropping plants and then the, the herbicides that are used to control the weeds don't work anymore. So I think we have to be very careful that we contain our systems uh, and, and part of that's going to require some really thoughtful approaches to uh, maintaining security and making sure that there are particular conditions which those organisms will survive in and others which they won't. And I think that's particularly important for um, external applications, bioremediation, agriculture, um, things that are not contained in stainless steel vessels. Um, in the case of the, uh, the more classically fermented type uh, systems, then I think um, the problems there are likely to be, uh, you know, high rates of success, 
uh, products that work well. Um, I don't think I'm gonna, we're going to see surprises in that realm because the systems are pretty well understood and we've been doing things in that, in that vein for a long time. In terms of ethical issues, um, you know, if, if the problems are unintended consequences and we make sure that we have uh, pretty successful or pretty effective uh, multi-step control systems in place and some real thoughtful analysis about things before we go into um, major new undertakings, then I, I think we'll be able to manage those. I think there are, are some advantages to having people thinking about things in a precautionary way. What are the, the um, unlikely but potentially catastrophic outcomes from a particular technology? And uh, to put in protective safeguards against those. Um, there are ethical issues with, I guess what I'll call um, evil uh, actions. You know, there are people out there that don't want to do good. And um, the, the tools of biology and synthetic biology could be used for ill. And I think that we do have to um, think about that pretty carefully, make sure that we do have some safeguards. Uh, of course, working with uh, dangerous living material is not a very safe thing, and so people would have to have pretty strong motivation and, um, and pretty good safeguards themselves to try to do such a thing. I don't think it's something you have to worry about a lot with um, kitchen biologists. But, uh, but I do think that there are um, some real issues there and understanding uh, particularly some of the, uh, the, the security risks around pathogens uh, and uh, those particular genetic sequences that have strong potential for creating epidemics in people or other living species. Um, we need to be paying attention to that and, and making sure that we've got systems in place to manage that information. Traditional genetic engineering is, you know, it's really only been around about as long as I have, so it's not that traditional, but, um, but it's, it's based on uh, mutations, and m mutations can be created by many different mechanisms, um, and in more recent decades, that's included uh, intended inserts of genetic material. But oftentimes, without a lot of understanding about where those inserts were happening, uh, without a lot of control over where they're occurring and how they're being controlled, and with the potential for some additional genetic material to be moved into the, the genome of the host organism that wasn't meant to be moved. So lots of different technologies to do conventional genetic engineering, but they tend to have those weaknesses. Uh, with synthetic biology, we know the sequence we're inserting, we know where we're inserting it, we can put it there with a high degree of fidelity and definition and, um, and also control other things that we put next to it so that we can actually control not just uh, whether some particular protein is, is expressed, but when it's expressed, how much of it's expressed, et cetera. So there's a lot more control possible with synthetic biology than with conventional tools. Well, I think there are two really important reasons to get in undergraduates involved in synthetic biology. One, and, and the real uh, initial motivator for me, is for their own experience. Um, I think that undergraduates being engaged with research is one of the most valuable educational experiences they can have. And particularly team research, uh, where they're actually working with each other and understanding how, in a working environment, they can accomplish something, um, is really important. And in the area of biology and biological engineering and associated fields, there really aren't too many team competitions. So this is a great opportunity to create a, a team activity around the science and engineering of biology. Um, I happen to be really fortunate as an undergraduate to be involved in a team uh, research activity and it really changed the, the trajectory of my career. Uh, before then I would have never thought about being a researcher or a professor or anything like that. I didn't know anybody who had that kind of career. And uh, so it really opened my eyes and, and changed my life. And so, you know, I don't really care whether all the students in our iGEM program become professors or researchers. I hope they find something interesting to do. And I think the expansion of the opportunities that that, that um, implies is what we're really about. The other thing, though, is 
you know, the students get something out of it, but they give a lot to it also. And I think that the creativity and the new ideas and um, the, the possibility that's there with somebody that's just exposed to some new tools and new um, opportunities to think about things creativity, creatively is really valuable. And I think that synthetic biology as a field has advanced um, much more quickly because of the contributions of the undergraduates in the iGEM process. So I think it works both ways.